All right, welcome to another episode of the Nightcast, where we talk about Christian education, kind of a layer deep, and we put proverbial skin on it uh, so people can see what's going on, what's our thought processes about how we go about doing Christian education. So today we've got a special guest. I've got Paul Coughlin uh, from the uh, from the book Free Us from Bullying. And I'll go ahead and plug your book at the very beginning because of it's had a huge impact on me as a head of school. Um, and we're going to put this in the link below. So if you want to purchase uh, this book, and we'll, you'll be able to follow that link, and it'll take you right to the Amazon so you can purchase it. But Mr. Coughlin, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So just to kind of kick us off, tell me what bullying is such a, it's a delicate issue and it's systemic, but what kind of drew you in to say like, hey, I'm going to spend the time to do the research and write this book. Give me a, give me a little bit of that, that, that backstory. Yeah. So I had written a book uh, a number of years ago uh, called No More Christian Nice Guy. So I spoke at a lot of men's conferences, uh, Promise Keepers, Iron Sharpens Iron. And uh, I noticed that when I talked about justice, uh, good old fashioned justice, right, that my audience would just like really, you know, rise up. And so I thought, and, and, and that, that was pretty uh, powerful to me. So I asked myself, well, where is justice missing? And uh, just uh, just a ton of work, uh, seeking wisdom higher than my own. I settled upon adolescent bullying. And I thought certainly there you know, would have to be a faith-based response because it does stem from spiritual ailments, uh, much of it. And I found that there wasn't one and I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So uh, if I could do something genuinely um, pro-social, uh, if I could do something that could really move the needle in regard to bullying, uh, particularly within a certain lane, we work with public schools too, uh, but you know, within private Christian schools, uh, I wanted to do that. And um uh, and then also, too, I had experienced bullying as well, uh, obviously playground bullying uh, here or there, but I experienced a lot of it in my home. And so uh, yeah. growing up, so the uh, um, I know what it I know where it really stems from. I know what it really does to people. And uh, we know how to really help people. Mm. Yeah. So as a head of school, uh, maybe four years ago, three years ago. I was doing research because I saw this issue and you're right. There was just a dearth of resources and I came across your material. And so of course I purchased the book and I read it. And so many of the things that you said in this book resonated with me and they were things I had never heard before. Uh, they were almost counter everything I had heard before, but intuitively when I read it, I was like, oh, this guy's got it. This is this is right. Because I was, I was a dean of students for five years, and I've been ahead of school now for 10 years, and I've, yeah, I've seen it a million times. Uh, but all of the information that I'd received before, like bullies or hurt people that are covering up for insecurities, and you, you, know, you just hear that. It's almost like it's the mantra, right? And, but as a head of school, I was like, that's not been my experience with bullies. Uh, so tell me a little bit about, you have a different, you have a different look on bullying than I've ever seen. Tell me a little bit about your perspective on that, that you brought. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You brought up the insecurities uh, that, and a lot of people believe that, well, first of all, sure, there's some bullies who are uh, insecure, but we're talking about the body, the bell curve, what kind of people are they, what's really motivating them. And what's interesting is today's modern day anti-bullying movement in America and much of the world really stems out of the 19, late 1960s, early 70s. And even back in the early 70s, there was research from the Oelius uh, Institute, Dan Oelius, uh, who's, the, who's the patriarch of the anti-bullying movement. Uh, Barbara Corleoso, in my opinion, is the matriarch, and she endorses uh, Free Us From bullying. Um, he, Dan had information that told us early on that bullies don't have low self-esteem um, uh, from the onset. But I think what happened is that the 
self-esteem movement, which remember had a lot of promise, right? It was supposed to mm-hmm. decrease domestic violence, test scores, bullying, you know, drunk driving, racism, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it just didn't deliver. Uh, but yet there are, there are people who really have to keep that myth alive. And that's really, really, really unfortunate because, you know, we're giving kids who bully the wrong prescription. Um, we are telling kids who bully, or, or at least serial bullies, that's really where the harm is. We're telling them that what they really need to do is feel better about themselves, see themselves as being more important. When in reality, studies show that many of them are motivated by self-love, not self-hate. It's really hubris uh, that drives a lot of bullies. And we know this through um, uh, testing. So children identified as serial bullies are asked to identify themselves. uh, How popular are you in the class? How good are you at math relative to your classmates? How good are you at, you know, at English and who, uh, you know, a bunch of other things. And across the board, serial bullies uh, score themselves higher than they really are relative um, to their classmates. So they really think they're pretty wonderful. And they, and because of that, They think other people deserve to be treated poorly because they're underneath them. Your average bully doesn't see uh, the target uh, as an equal. They really see them as below them due to real or perceived um, differences. And then, of course, uh, they do it to score points. And you can actually sadly become more popular uh, by bullying other people. And then, but that popularity wanes uh, right around the uh, sophomore year in high school. Uh, their classmates wake up and say, you know, I thought this was funny. Actually, this is horrible. And then the serial bullet begins to get more marginalized. But yeah, they don't have a necessarily low self-esteem. Um, they're no more abused in the home than any other group of people. In fact, the people who have low self-esteem tend to be serial targets. They're the, they're the walking wounded um, among us, not just in school, but in adult life as well. Yeah. yeah. You talked about a trifecta in your book. Uh, it was uh, like uh, narcissism, uh, deriving pleasure from inducing someone else's pain, and one other one. I forgot what it was, but it was one of those. It was a trifecta of personality traits that created a serial bully. Now, a serial bully, and make this distinction, there are kids that sometimes just get drawn into some bullying. They're not necessarily serial bullies, but if bullying's going on and they're by, they're like, I don't want to, they're trying to navigate that situation socially. And so if someone else isn't bullying, they're not going to initiate it themselves. But a serial bully is because of these personality traits, it's compulsive for them. Yeah. And they tend to have a grandiose sense of who they are. And and then sadly, what often comes with that is some degree of charisma, right? And then they get other people to do things they normally would never do. They just wouldn't do it. So they're the ringleader. And it's really sad. And, you know, uh, we both know this is um, a serial bully. So a kid who doesn't stop, parents don't take it seriously. You sit down with the parents and you say, hey, this is what's going on at the school. We need your help. You need to be, you know, you need to address this seriously. Sadly, it's really difficult to get the parents um, to come on board with you. And that kid is headed for a lot of harm later on. They could be four to five times more likely to commit a felony uh, by their middle 20s and three to four times more likely to abuse their future spouse and children. And studies show if we don't get them before the age of, say, 14, if we can't somehow turn their heart Uh, move them in a more pro-social direction, they can continue in that behavior. And if they don't get expelled, what they're expert at, sadly, because they get better year after year, they know how to throttle their behavior down just enough not to get kicked out, but they don't, they don't, they don't give up. They like it too much. It's too pleasurable. I mean, think about it. It is, it is pleasurable to dominate and control another person. Uh, It is pleasurable uh, to inflict difficulty on that person. Uh, I just gave our our watchers, our audience, uh, the definition of sadism. It is, it's a, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. And make no mistake, bullying 
carries with it a particular pleasure, but it leads to the tremendous harm uh, down the road. And let's say that the serial bully is able to escape, you know, prison time, uh, then it almost makes them worse uh, because they have just enough ability not to be put behind bars, but make people miserable and make them miserable in the workplace. They make them miserable in the in the home They make people miserable at church. And uh, but a lot of people, nice people don't know how to handle that kind of person. They think that if you're just nicer to them, that you'll melt their heart and uh, and then you'll convict them of their sin and uh, you'll play a role in their change. I, and I'll tell you, I've tried that with uh, bully bosses. It never worked. They were not interested in changing. They're interested in other people changing. Mm. Yeah, and as a head of school, that was a wake-up call for me. Uh, I had to say, like, and I, and I saw it. You know, when I read that in the book, I was like, it's totally right. Very, very rarely without an incredible amount of parental support. Now, if I've had a ton of parental support and we catch the behavior at age six or seven, you, you can make some major adjustments in a child. Um, but if I've got a teenager that is, I've kind of identified those serial bullying things, I've realized that my ability to curb that behavior through detention or suspension is is very limited. Uh, and so I had to change tact as a head of school and say, we can't be long sufferers of this type of behavior uh, because a sufferer of that type of behavior as a head of school, then the victims of this bully, they are, I am conscripting them into long suffering as well. And that's not, that's not just. Not at all. And you use the word conscripting. Wow. That is, that is a powerful word. I've not heard that used before in regard to this setting. I, and I, I agree. Sadly, often um, kindness and mercy and grace to a serial bully is often cruelty to the car, the target and that target's family. Uh, it it ripples through the home. A kid who was happy, you know, a kid who enjoyed going to school now is miserable. And now they're going through psychological and, you know, I would say also spiritual uh, uh, trauma. And they don't know how to handle it. And then they start lashing out at their siblings, for example. They're the ones who have mysterious illnesses. And they're real. Uh, their stomach is all torn up in knots. They don't want to go back to school, uh, you know, the next day. So truancy goes up. Yeah, I wish it were different. I wish that there were a magic formula with with serial bullies and how we can transform them. I think we have to be very careful with the usual spiritual prescriptions that we've been given uh, that sound good, but are divorced from how the world really works, or at least how serial bullies really think and how they act. Um, uh, we we got to be careful because we're allowing a lot of harm to to uh, take place under our uh, our guard. Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, I think that defining the term bully is critical because I, as a head of school, I often will have a parent say, "So and so is bullying so and so," and then I look at the situation and I'm like, "Okay, there's not a power imbalance here." there's not this, this responds to discipline or, you know, those types of things. And I'm like, oh, you just have a conflict with someone and you want them to change and they want you to change. That's not bullying. That's just conflict. Uh, and so we need appropriate conflict resolution strategies in this situation. And then when I see bullying, it looks, smells, feels completely different. Um, and so walk us through a couple of those key indicators that you're in a bullying situation and not in a poor conflict resolution situation. Great. And we recommend for every school to have an actual uh, bullying complaint form with the definition of bullying at the beginning. And uh, because people will think, oh, well, maybe it's not bullying. Yeah, it's the superior use of power. And it's usually verbal. At a younger age, it could be physical. And it still is physical throughout the school years. But you get in trouble for the physical stuff. You can, like, prove that, right? So um, it's the superior use of power that intends to harm another person multiple times and for no justifiable 
reason. And, and that's really important to keep in mind because it's not a one-off, right? You know, someone's in a bad mood and they give a, a kind of a nasty look across the room. Someone gets hit in the head with, a, uh, you know, on the playground uh, with the dodgeball and it's not on purpose. Uh, it's accidental. Uh, not being chosen to be the a leader of a class project. Uh, some parents will see that as uh, bullying as well. Uh, it's not. It's it's garden variety, putting other people down multiple times for real or perceived differences. And it intends to humiliate. Uh, it intends to, uh, uh, to also intimidate in most cases, most of the time where they say, if you tell someone, you know, I'm just going to make it worse for you. So it includes a lot of fundamental um, elements of our life. But I would like to add one other thing, and it's important to keep in mind, is some definitions of bullying include audacity. And at the protectors, we include audacity as well, because many of us who don't serial bully or even bully, we often can't believe what the bully did. You know, it's like that is just so out of bounds. But when you realize that a serial abuser, which is a bullying is fundamentally abuse. When you realize that many serial abusers, they don't see their actions as audacious. They are really important. They're they're full of self-importance. Therefore, what they do is justifiable. And so it's audacious to the rest of us. But to them, it's like, no, this makes sense. They're never going to come out and say, I, <laughs> I'm more important than you. But their behaviors really do. Yeah, that's powerful. Um so that that concept and the way that we define it at Providence is that there's a power imbalance. It's repeated, uh, and it doesn't adjust immediately to correction. Um, so th- that's going to be our those are kind of our hallmarks that we're that we're looking for. And when we see those things, that's going to be a huge highlight for us. But I think the one thing you pointed out, the biggest lie that I found that bullies like to tell their victims. Or I can't tell if the bullies tell their victims that or the victims internalize that naturally is that if they say something, it's going to get worse. And I'll even have parents sit in my office and say, we didn't want to say anything because we didn't want to make it worse. And it's like the biggest lie there ever was because it's the ultimate cure. It's the only cure. If no one knows, no one can help you. Uh, and so the only way that no one can know is if you don't say anything, I found that's the most part that boggles my mind the most, but also if we could break down just that lie, I think we would get rid of 95% of it. Indeed. And you, we both know why that poor kid is begging their parents not to say anything. And right. it usually is a watershed moment. Like for example, we're going to be coming up on uh, holiday, right? And so kids will go home for like one, two weeks in uh, December. And during that time, the kid is just going to leak out and they can't keep it in anymore. They've, they tell their parents, of course, they beg them not to say anything. And then um, you'll start hearing about these things that you never knew about uh, in January when you get back to yeah. when the school year begins. And what's really sad is um, you may not hear about it till the end of May because school's out uh, in early June and that's not an accident. You know, the kid has begged them not to say anything and they've, they're already going to another school and they tell you in May that they're not enrolling and you've been kept in the dark for months and you really could have helped that kid. You know, one thing to talk about, I just returned from a school in California about this topic uh, because we had a, a really great parent night there and um, anonymous reporting, anonymous reporting um, really takes the uh, weight off the shoulders of the target and that the target can say, hey, I didn't say anything. Someone else, right. you know, someone else must have seen it, um, but I didn't say a word. And so uh, that is something to really consider within education. I know, for example, the program Stop It has has 
saved a lot of kids from bullying. It's decreased some bullying by something like 75% in some places. So something to keep in mind to, to overcome this tremendously powerful and big hurdle in the lives of targets and their families. Mm, yeah, that's powerful because no kid wants to, if you walk into the headmaster's office, like, Gosh, that, I mean, that takes courage. I have adults before they come into my office that aren't in trouble at all. They're just coming to meet me. They they tense up before they walk into my office just because, I don't know, there's something about that dynamic that we've created. And so to have, and we're going to talk about how we help those that are being bullied here in a moment, uh, because I think that's a, one of the, a really valuable part of your book and your program. Uh, but yeah, having a way a safe place to be able to anonymously say, Hey, I'm having a problem. Um, and, and being able to create that open communication. It's just like in a marriage or in a business or whatever communication, good communication solves 99% of your problems. Bad communication will create a problem out of nothing. Uh, and so, no, that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, and we've kind of brainstormed some, avenues for that and then COVID happened and kind of shut everything down <laughs> so now everybody's just like okay how do we how do we relook at this but I think that that is a valuable uh that could be a really valuable tool for us uh as we go forward um it, it helps the bystander get over the similar huddles they don't want to be called a snitch and sure. um they I mean with with these anonymous programs they truly are uh anonymous you cannot find out uh, the, even the people who who create the program don't know. And one of the reasons why, where the, the text came from, the information came from, because one reason why they don't want to know is uh, liability purposes. And so they truly want to be anonymous uh, and give you the best information that you know they can possibly give you. Absolutely. Now that's great. Um, so as a as a father, I'm always, I can't control every situation that my child walks into, right? I can't like eliminate every bully that may be in their life. Now, as a head of school, that's my job. That's my prerogative is to say like, we're not going to have bullies here at the school. And I have some, uh, some amount of institutional control over that. But as I look at my children and I prepare my children, I've got a son who's in the second grade and a daughter who's in the fourth grade. Uh, and I've worked on training them on a lot of the things that I read in your book just to kind of prepare them to not become a target. So talk about, and we, again, I, you do a really good job explaining this in your book. We are not in any way, shape, or form victim blaming uh, in these types of things. That is not what we're talking about at all. It's not, it's not because a kid did something wrong that they're being bullied, but we're trying to put tools in their tool belt to help them in life to not be, for lack of a better word, a soft target. So talk, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, there's the good news is their uh, targets and their families have a lot more power and control than they realize, uh, but they have to overcome um, some fears and some uncertainties. Yeah, a, a bully is not looking for a fight. A bully wants to overwhelm. And so they look for the kid that they're pretty sure they can overwhelm. And uh, right uh, October, it was anti-bully month in America. And that's because by October, most every bully has selected their target. Uh, they profile it. It's really criminal behavior in a young body. Um, they look for this a kind of person who they believe will accept provocation and provide no meaningful pushback. So, for example, they'll look for the kids who obviously who are isolated, you know, they're new to the school, they don't have a social structure, and so they're uncomfortable, and they don't have friends who might stand up for them because they don't have friends yet. So, I mean, that's an obvious one. But, you know, they profile, for example, body language, weak body language. Um, they profile people who, for example, look uncomfortable in social settings, darting eyes, uh, uh, slumped over shoulders, um, short strides, uh, and a lack of, of eye contact as well. And then also uh, the tone of their voice uh, may come across as being weak. And this is the stuff they look for. And then what they do is they, they test that person out. And the poor kid, because most of our kids have no anti-bullying training, 
they're just, it's not on their radar that someone would go out of their way to make their life difficult. It's just not who they are. So they don't think other people, you know, will do that. And then what they do is they escalate their um, uh, provocation to the point where it begins, you know, the, if a person, for example, has, you know, like a speech impediment or the, the shape of their ears might be a little different. And then they just, they intensify their um, attacks and it can get pretty bad, you know, pretty quickly. So targets and the families have a lot more power than they realize. Um, unfortunately, what they often do is hyper-focus on the bully and particularly the motivations of the bully. We know one thing for sure in the motivation of a bully. Bullies bully because they can. After that, it's not necessarily a crapshoot, but what we think is the case may or may not be the case. And even then, it almost doesn't matter. You're not going to, our kid is not responsible to change the bully. And we often put that weight on our kids, and particularly mm. with the spiritual veneer, unfortunately. Mm. What we really need to do is give that kid the tools they need to not be attractive to a, a, a serial bully and, and then also how to ward them off. We'll often say parents will say, um, oh, I've heard a lot of things, but they'll say, well, if you if you respond to a bully, you might be as bad as the bully themselves. Um, it's such an unfair thing to say to someone. They'll often say, uh, well, just ignore the bully and they'll go away. That could be true. It could also be a horrible plan because by not saying something, it is seen as weakness and weakness right. invites aggression among the malevolent. So if we're showing weakness, they have a target. It, it, it's so much similar to people who suffer crime. Uh, if, uh, if you want to not suffer crime, don't let the criminal choose time and location. And the same as with bullies, they choose time and location over a kid in order to ambush them. So there's a number of things we can do, verbal comebacks, uh, whatever uh, is a good one because it's dismissive, but it's not an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's, it's not revenge uh, speak. We're not allowed as believers to get into revenge. But I believe we're allowed to defend our dignity, value, and, and worth from other people. And we're allowed to defend ourselves from abusers. Yeah. Uh, we're not required to accept abuse. And this is an important one, too. The most tortured scripture in the theater of bullying will be turn the other cheek. Uh, yeah. I, 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 so much so that it, uh, ACSI asked uh, the legal department, asked me to write an article uh, as to uh, what it really means. It has nothing to do with adolescent bullying. It has nothing to do with the fourth grader being bullied on a playground. But in context, it means to have a generous spirit. I don't have time to get into all of that. But it, 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 such great harm has been done to our kids when we don't allow them to defend their dignity, value, and worth. And one of the people in uh, Free Us From Bullying, who pointed that out. And one of my favorite interviews was Frank Peretti. Uh, I don't know if you saw that part in there, but I had a wonderful interview with Frank. His parents were pacifists and he was not allowed to defend himself. Um, and as a result, he said it was like, he was like chum in the water because people mm -hmm. zeroed in on that, other boys. And they made his life miserable. And I interviewed him when he was 65. He cried during the interview. Um, he got angry during the interview uh, due to these injustices that were done. Part of them he allowed to happen with misguided um, Christianity. Yeah, that can be such a uh, a trap to fall into uh, because we have dignity, we have value, we're made in the image of God. And so a child gets to defend that value. Um that is not narcissism. Uh, that is just saying that this can't, this isn't allowed. This is not okay to happen to me. And my job as a person is not to allow you to belittle me so that I don't cause you discomfort. Uh, and that can be so encouraged because there is a desire for peace and harmony. Most of us have a peace and harmony bent. And we want peace at all costs. and But what it does is it only makes our situation worse uh, when we don't 
with dignity and with care and with wisdom stand up for the dignity and value that God's placed in us? A girl, a serial target of bullying, female, can be 25 times more likely to develop agoraphobia than a non-serial target of bullying. That is profound. Uh, God did not give us our children so they could be the plaything of benevolent individuals. I've used that term a few times. Um, Roughly 15% of the people we meet may have malevolent intent. And uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's basic. That's almost one out of every eight people. Mm. And the, the, they will they will shut our lives down if you let them. They will literally derail your life. They will destroy your life if you let them. So the sooner we uh, train our children how to spot such a benevolent person and how to handle such a person, the better off their life is going to be. And I would argue that uh, they're far more likely to fulfill their role in the kingdom of heaven, to do the, the will of our Lord. They'll be less handcuffed. Yes. the Because Satan wants to destroy. He wants to devour. He wants to take them out of the game. Uh, and I've seen bullying be a tool. Uh, to prevent those uh, positive things happening in a kid's life. Let's change tax for half a second because in my experience, I've been in school administration for 15 years now. Year one, there was some bullying that took place via text. Kids would text each other and, you know, every now and then, and it was rare, but it would happen. Um, Now the majority of a child's life when they're adolescents, I feel like is spent online and less in the actual real world. So talk to me a little bit about social media bullying, how that's morphed and changed. Uh, because as a parent, I don't, I don't have TikTok. I'm not in on, I don't understand. It's hard for me to follow all these latest trends. Uh, but our kids are in it, obviously. Uh, and so what are some, what are some advice pieces or help ex- unex- explain to us what's happening? Yeah, social media. I mean, if you could, if you had a magic wand, you could think of uh, almost a, you know, a bully's playground, right? Uh, particularly when it first became popular, there was hardly any guardrails on it. Uh, you would do, Social media would be a great thing to create, particularly if you can be anonymous in your attacks. You know, studies show people are far more ni- uh, likely to be nasty uh, when they're anonymous uh, in communicating with other people. The good news is many of the answers to face-to-face bullying are the same answers uh, when it comes to social media, to being bullied online. One, to the best of a child's ability, um, do not give a public display of pain and anguish. That is what the bully wants. It is electrifying. It makes them laugh. It makes them feel superior. It feels wonderful when a bully can get a rise, you know, out of another kid. I was speaking at Saddleback Church a number of years ago. And before I got there, there was a, in the newspaper, there was a 14-year-old boy who had committed bully side. And the paper printed the dialogue between him and the people who bullied him. And he would say things like this, why are you doing this to me? I'm a nice person. I mean, you hardly even know me. The bully already knew all that stuff. So each time he was able to get that poor boy to respond, they would just ratchet up the, you know, the attacks. Yeah. And then also just the verbal comeback to online, um, you just write in whatever, you know, you have an interesting life. I've got better things to do. Uh, there, so, um, you know, pushing back without being violent uh, themselves. But the real answer to online bullying is the same when it comes to -to face-to-face. If we can get that bystander to do something pro-social online, Mm -hmm. to stand up for the kid who's being bullied, because you had mentioned earlier how difficult it is for authority to change the heart, mind, soul, or spirit, uh, particularly of a serial bully. But a a 10-year landmark study in America found that the secret sauce to any anti-bullying effort is a bystander intervention because yeah. they care about what their peers think. So if their peers can denounce the behavior in an assertive but nonviolent way, that 
works. So if we can get the bystander to get in there and say, no, that's not, that's my friend. They're great. Uh, this is, this is mean. This is, this doesn't even make sense what you're saying. You know, there's a lot of things that, that people can say online and they're in the book free us from bullying. Sure. Yeah. And there's also this, uh, we have this curriculum that we, uh, that we use at the school. Um, and we take those kids through, uh, different, kind of play scenarios, working with them, how to respond, what do you do, what are words to say, uh, how can you be a, how can you be a protector um, in in that environment? And they love it. I mean, it's kind of hokey, you know, I've been in many of those uh, lessons, you know, where kids are going through it and, and, you know, they're laughing, they're giggling and stuff, but they're getting it. They, they're getting it. The other thing we can do um, and a few schools have done this, is we can cyber support one another. We need to make it cool to be kind. So for example, I was done speaking in uh, Plano, Texas. I was done at 12 and I, I had encouraged the uh, high schoolers to cyber support one another, create uh, uh, social media accounts where you only say good things about your classmates. So 53 minutes later, one of the uh, principals came up to me and said, you're not going to believe it. And he showed me a, a, a screenshot of a Twitter account where it, it was a boy on the bas- baseball team I had found out later, started a positive account and within and just said something really good about, I think, a girl's, for example, violin playing. I think that's what it was. Within 53 minutes, it had 159 followers. That's pretty right. incredible. So just going online, taking like particularly maybe more popular people to take that social capital that they have. And we normally spend it on ourselves at that age. You know, I'm not putting kids down. I probably did the same thing. But if we could uh, be encouraged to take that popularity and spend it on other people just by saying good things about them can fundamentally change that kid's life, but it can also change uh, the culture of a school. Mm, absolutely. I, was, I meet with the seniors each year and I tell them, you have way more power over this school than I ever will as a head of school uh, and senior class and senior leaders that step up. They, they have the ability to change a whole school culture if they choose to use it um, and how they choose to use their influence will it'll, it'll change the course of a ship. It will. I'll give you an example from the curriculum there. So this uh, another school, uh, they become protectors. You don't have to become a protector, right? There's a challenge in the end and he did it. He's the, I think he was the quarterback of the football team and he had noticed that his teammates were bullying another boy at lunchtime uh, near the, uh, in the um, stands. And all he did, and this is in the curriculum, all he did is he just sat next to the boy. <laughs> and then everyone just dissipates. You know, they just they just went away. The power that you say in regard to that senior class is remarkable. And, you know, that's what leaders do. You know, we, we say we want uh, strong kids. We say we want our kids to be leaders. I'm not quite convinced we do because uh, we also, as parents, don't want our kids to suffer difficulty, <laughs> sacrifice, <Yeah. laughs> the kinds of things that lead to you know a more mature spirit and certainly um, a leader. Uh, the more we realize as a culture and, and particularly as parents that no is one of the most spiritual words we will ever say, not just on behalf of ourselves, but on behalf of others. The better we're going to be, the best leaders are the ones who say no really well, but it's hard at first. And uh, the courage that it takes is like a muscle, and it really only grows by doing courageous things. And standing up for one another grows courage in the spirit uh, and soul of a person, unlike, I believe, most any other opportunity uh, during the school years. Well, thank you so much for your time, for sharing this information. Yeah, I want to encourage, if you're a parent that's listening to this podcast right now, and you're like, I think my kid's being bullied, reach out, say something. Don't bottle it up. Uh, That's the most powerful tool that you have. Email me. We will take it seriously. I promise we are not going to brush you off or belittle your 
issue. We're going to address it. And we're going to deal with it. Um, but say something. Uh, if you are a parent of a kid that's like, I don't think they're bullying I, or being bullied, just get the book. I want to encourage you to, to check it out, read it. It is powerful. It will give you tools to help your child as they go through school and adulthood. There's there's really powerful things in here. Uh, some just basic tips uh, and helps you understand the like, psychology that goes on with bullying to help you navigate and with your family those situations better in a Christ-like manner, in a godly manner, but one that restores and keeps the dignity of your child intact uh, as they walk through this world. Uh, but at Providence, we take bullying really seriously, uh, and we want to protect our children. Um, and if you're a student that's listening to this, and you're like, I want to be more involved. I, I, yeah, we did the worksheet, and I remember that. But And yeah, maybe I'm a prefect or something like that, and you've talked to me, but I feel convicted about being a better protector, being a better active bystander. Just talk to me. Uh, talk to one of your deans of students. Talk to Mr. Ballard. Uh, we will help give you the tools uh, to be successful uh, in protecting those around us because that's what God's called us to do. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're going to put links to your book uh, below in this. So if you're a parent and you want to check that out, uh, I highly recommend it. And I really appreciate it. Maybe we'll have you back. It's been it's been a couple of years, but here soon it'll be it, your the presentation you did at the school was great. It might be time to kind of run that back here soon. I've been I've been searching my email every day for the invitation. <laughs>